genius of a Chinese bookkeeper. He figured out his accounts on a machine like a gridiron, like a gridiron with buttons strung on its bars. The different rows represented units, tens, hundreds, and thousands. He figured them with incredible rapidity. In fact, he pushed them from place to place as fast as a musical professor's fingers travel over the keys of a piano. They are a kindly disposed, well-meaning race and are respected and well-treated by the upper classes all over the Pacific Coast. No Californian gentleman or lady ever abuses or oppresses a Chinaman under any circumstances, an explanation that seems to be much needed in the East. Only the scum of the population do it. They and their children, they and naturally and consistently the policemen and politicians Likewise, for these are the dust-licking pimps and slaves of the scum, there as well as elsewhere in America. Chapter 55 Tired of Virginia City An old schoolmate A two years alone, acting as an editor Almost receive an offer An accident Three drunken anecdotes Last look at Mount Davidson, a beautiful incident. I began to get tired of staying in one place so long. There was no longer satisfying variety in going down to Carson to report the proceedings of the legislature once a year and, hor and horse races and pumpkin shows once in three months. They had got to raising pumpkins and potatoes in Washoe Valley and of course, one of the first achievements of the legislature was to institute a $10,000 agricultural fair to show off $40 worth of the, those pumpkins in. However, the territorial legislature was usually spoken of as the, quote, asylum. I wanted to see San Francisco. I wanted to go somewhere. I wanted, I did not know what I wanted. I had the spring fever and wanted a change, principally no, d principally, no doubt. Besides, the convention had framed a state constitution. Nine men out of every ten wanted an office. I believed that these gentlemen would treat the moneyless and the irresponsible among the population into adopting the constitution and thus well-nigh killing the country. It could not well carry such a load as a state government since it had nothing to tax that could stand a tax, for undeveloped minds could not, and there were not fifty developed ones in the land. There was but little realty to tax, and it didn't seem as if nobody was ever going to think of the simple salvation of inflicting a money penalty on murder. I believed that a state government would destroy the flush times, and I wanted to get away. I believed that the mining stocks I had on hand would soon be worth $100,000 and thought if they reached that before the Constitution was adopted, I would sell out and make myself secure from the crash the change of government was going to bring. I, can, I considered $100,000 sufficient to go home with decently, though it was but a small amount compared to what I had been expecting to return with. I felt rather downhearted about it but I tried to comfort myself with the reflection that with such a sum I could not fall into want. About this time, a schoolmate of mine, whom I had not seen since boyhood, came tramping in on foot from Reese River, a very allegory of poverty. The son of wealthy parents, here he was in a strange land, hungry, bootless, mantled in an ancient horse blanket, roofed with a brimless hat, and so generally and so extravagantly dilapidated that he could have taken the shine out of the prodigal son himself, as he pleasantly remarked. He wanted to borrow forty-six dollars, twenty-six to take him to San Francisco, and twenty for something else, to buy some soap with, maybe, for he needed it. I found I had but little more than the amount wanted in my pocket, so I stepped in and borrowed forty-six dollars of a banker, on twenty days' time without the formality of a note, and gave it him, rather than walk half a block to the office where I had some spice laid up, some specie laid up. If anybody had told me that it would take me two years to pay back that forty-six dollars to the banker, for I did not expect it of the prodigal, and was, and was not disappointed, 
I would have felt injured, and so would the banker. I wanted a change. I wanted, a vari I wanted variety of some kind. It came. Mr. Goodman went away for a week and left me the, po the post of chief editor. It destroyed me. The first day I wrote my leader in the forenoon. The second day I had no subject and put it off till the afternoon. The third day I put it off till evening and then copied an elaborate editorial out of the American Cyclopedia that steadfast for that steadfast friend of the editor all over this land. The fourth day I fooled around till midnight and then fell back on the cyclopedia again. The fifth day I cruddled, crudgled my brain till midnight and then kept the press waiting while I penned some bitter personalities on six different people. The sixth day I labored in anguish till far into the night and brought forth nothing. The paper went to press without an editorial. The seventh day I resigned. On the eighth, Mr. Goodman returned and found six duels on his hands. My personalities had borne fruit. Nobody except he has tried it. Nobody except he has tried it knows what it is to be an editor. It is easy to scribble local rubbish with the facts all before you. It is easy to clip selections from other papers. It is easy to string out a correspondence from any locality but it is unspeakable hardship to write editorials. Subjects are the trouble, the dreary lack of them, I mean. Every day it's a drag, drag, drag. Think and worry and suffer. All the world is a dull blank, and yet the editorial columns must be filled. Only give the editor a subject and his work is done. It is no trouble to write it up. But fancy how you would feel if you had to pump your brains dry every day in the week. Fifty-two weeks in the year. It makes one low-spirited simply to think of it. The matter that each editor of a daily paper in America writes in the course of a year would fill from four to eighty bulky volumes like this book. Fancy what a library an editor's work would make after twenty or thirty years' service. Yet people often marvel that Dickens, Scott, Bulwer, Duma, etc. have been able to produce so many books. If these authors had wrought as volum voluminously as newspaper editors do, the result would be something to marvel at indeed. How editors can continue this tremendous labor, this exhausting consumption of brain fiber, for their work is creative and not a mere mechanical lying up of facts like reporting. Day after day and year after year is incomprehensible. Preachers take two months holiday in midsummer, for they find that to produce two sermons a week is wearying in the long run. In truth, it must be so, and is so. And therefore, how an editor can take from tw ten, 10 to 20 texts and build upon them from 10 to 20 painstaking editorials a week and keep it up all the year round is farther beyond comprehension than ever. Ever since I survived my week as editor, I have found at least one pleasure in any newspaper that comes to my hand. It is in admiring the long columns of editorial and wondering to myself how in the mischief he did it. Mr. Goodman's return relieved me of employment unless I chose to become a reporter again. I could not do that. I could not serve in the ranks after being general of the army. So I thought I would depart and go abroad into the world somewhere. Just at, the, at this juncture, Dan, my associate in the reportorial department, told me casually that two citizens had been trying to persuade him to go with them to New York and aid in selling a rich silver mine which they had discovered and secured in a new mining district in our neighborhood. He said they offered to pay his expenses and give him one-third of the proceeds of the sale. He had refused to go. It was the very opportunity I wanted. I abused him for keeping so quiet about it and not mentioning it sooner. He said it had not occurred to him that I would like to go, and so he had recommended them to apply to Marshall, the reporter of the other paper. I asked Dan if it was a good, honest mine and no swindle. He said the men had shown him nine tons of the rock, which they had got out to take to New York, 
and he could cheerfully say that he had seen but little rock in Nevada that was richer. And moreover, he said that they had secured a tract of valuable timber and a mill site near the mine. My first idea was to kill Dan, but I changed my mind, notwithstanding I was so angry, for I thought maybe the chance was not yet lost. Dan said it was by no means lost, that the men were absent at the mine again, and would not be in Virginia to leave for the east for some ten days, that they had requested him to do, to do the talking to Marshall, and he had promised that he would either secure Marshall or somebody else for him by the time they got back. He would now say nothing to anybody till they returned, and then fulfill his promise by furnishing me to them. It was splendid. I went to bed all on fire with excitement, for nobody had yet gone east to sell a Nevada silver mine, and the field was white for the sickle. I felt that such a mine as the one described by Dan would bring a princely sum in New York and sell without deal or difficulty. I could not sleep, my fancy so rioted through its castles in the air. It was the blind lead come again. That could be a statue oh, okay. of a huge... Oh, yeah, you're probably Wait, right. did it move? Uh, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Do you mean what, they make sound when they move? When... Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. You know, and, and it's like... <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess it is, because that's, look, that's what's playing on the soundtrack. Yeah, well, it that's... says right here, notation for... Oh, I see, okay, I'll... Okay, wait. Now, now, how many oodles? And then the doodle. Does the doodle start over again? Twelve oodles. All right. One doodle and a doodle again. Okay. I can hear you though. I can hear your darn thing. What darn thing is? Next week on those darn spiders, the renegade arachnids tie up two insurance salesmen and devour them slowly, sucking out their internal body fluid. Okay, now the uh, body fluids are being emptied into the snudothorax of the giant spider. The fear has and, uh, that arts of geniuses must be liquidated immediately. And see, that these SS the are Nazis used to have order. giant spiders in there. Okay, the existing the extermination centers at East Europe will be open to arts of geniuses. Okay, giants. Uh, enter giant spider effects. Turn on the fans. I saw and this in a, at a drive-in first, you know, this I never saw it in the theater, and I thought the spiders were fake men, you know, but the and the theater screen, somehow they don't look that bad. Yeah, what? yeah, I guess so, and they're, yeah, giant spider vision, or what do you call it, arachnid vision, or whatever. You have to put on the special glasses, you know, they're these hairy yeah. things that yeah, you need a special eyes. show. Yeah, show. Uncle Hal? I'm here. There he is. But I can barely hear you. I have a request for my show day. Is there some sort of animal creeping around outside the <laughs> control room? Oh, no, it's all right. Just a radio animal. Well, oh, what's no. your well, Go question? ahead with request for show oh, day. okay. I'm not... Well, I'm ready for the scary portion of the show, and I'm not leaving until I get to talk to Ann Bertha. I have a question for her. Well, I can okay, relay uh, it. Uh, yeah, next we're time going Bertha into the spirit here. Ann Bertha is... I think she's conjuring here in the dark. Dank, cold, drippy studio. All right, you can ask your question now. Okay, I have a question. I forgot to go to church last week, hon. What's going to happen to me? You forgot to do what? I forgot to go to church last Sunday. What's going to happen to me? You're going to burn. What on earth? Not only that, but you hear the song continually. The song, you know? You hear the song.